Hey, welcome everybody. I'm really, really happy to be here in this super beautiful city with so many amazing people. And I'm also really excited because I think this is going to be an awesome event. I think you can feel it. You can feel it in the air. We're going to have lots of sessions to learn about live ray and live ray related technologies. We're going to share with you the, the things that we're cooking for the next versions of live ray, and we want to hear your feedback. And we're also going to make some very big announcements in this release. So it's going to be really, really exciting. So before we start, I want to make sure you guys are ready. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay, some of you. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay, that, that's, that's it. So in this first session, we're going to talk about what we expect will be happening in the future and what's our vision for it. And I think it's, it's really, really important that we put that out and we share with you what our vision is. And it's also very important to understand that vision to understand where we are coming from. So this is, um, this is Life Race fifth DEF CON, okay? I think this is the 13th year of Life Ray as a company. But I don't know if some of you know that the product existed long before that. The development of Life Ray Portal started in year 2000. So this is the 17th year of development. It's quite an achievement. This has been a great journey, and we've learned a lot along the way. And the best person to tell you about this journey is the person that started it all, Brian Chan. Hey folks, welcome to DevCon this year in Amsterdam. I really wish I could be there in person instead of filming this in LA, but my daughter had an emergency a spinal cord surgery, so I couldn't be there. Um, I'm really praying that I could be there next year with you guys in the flesh. Uh, but uh, this year, if you guys could, please hashtag this conference like crazy. I want to stalk you guys online and know every beer that you guys have had and enjoyed uh, and every uh, talk that you guys um, enjoy. So, um, but I have a lot to share in my heart, so here it is. From about 2000, 2004, I um, spent all my off hours working on, on LifeRay because I wanted to build this software for my church. But no, my church didn't use it because what they really wanted was they wanted a Honda Civic or they really wanted just a, a motorcycle. But instead, I gave them a, a monster truck or I gave them a Caterpillar Earth Mover. So it was just far more than what they needed. So uh, from 2000 to 2004, my church never uh, ended up using it long term. They used it for, for a small period of time, it just didn't fit. And, but I open sourced it. And so the company that Jorge Ferrer worked for, um, they needed a portal because they had just bought, they spent a gaz not gazillion, but I think millions of, of dollars on this other piece of software that was garbage and didn't work for them and didn't, didn't, didn't uh, fulfill what they needed. So at the very last minute, a couple months before their project was due, they ended up uh, using LifeRay and they were able to complete their project. And so from that, we started having um, consulting gigs. Um, and we needed office space because um, we needed to congregate and, and, and uh, meet together. And the church was only used on Friday nights and Sunday mornings. See those tiny chairs? We used to interview people in those chairs. That's amazing. We took our clients here. And we did consulting for many years. Uh, but from that, we realized consulting didn't give us enough of a margin to keep investing the product because you're always just working on customizations. So we then, I don't remember the year, maybe it was 2008, 2009, and we basically made the bet and said, we're actually gonna uh, have an enterprise edition and um, start selling um, software on top of it, on top of our consulting. And we did that and, and we grew tremendously from that. And, um, and then now, and then a couple years later, we went from selling software to doing subscriptions. I think it's important for us to know where we came from and to know our roots, because then you can, you can tell the intent of, um, 
of how we do things. My daughter, she's uh, five years old now, and she has this neurological degenerative disease called Neiman Pick Type C. There's only a couple hundred people in the world with it. And basically by the time you're a toddler, you exhibit symptoms of, of Alzheimer's. But in order to take care of her well, I need to be able to monitor how she's doing. And the equipment that my hospital gives me, it's, it's honestly from the 1980s. I'm slowly adapting a bunch of sensors um, into uh, Galley's equipment. And using that, I'm playing around right now and, I, and, I'm, and I'm building something new. I really wanted to demo it at this DEF CON, but I won't be able to until the next DEF CON. But basically a combination of uh, LifeRay with our workflow forms, uh, with our web content, and uh, a bunch of IoT devices um, running on WeDeploy. So that's, that's how I'm, I'm tweaking with Life right now, and I'm hoping to demo that next year. We're constantly looking at the innovation that's happening around us, because we're gonna change, and, and we're constantly doing it, and you can look at our commits. Life is constantly changing, and, we, and we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna constantly evolve so that you uh, folks, developers from the community who spend time within the Life ecosystem, you're gonna constantly get benefits by being, um, by investing in us. I think if I were to go back in time and talk to my 18 year old self about programming, no matter what I told my old self, I don't think my old self would have comprehended it. For me, I learned through experience and it took working within an open source community and being taught by the community. So this is, this is a confession. I, didn't, I, I honestly did not know the difference between a concrete class and an interface. And the guy who taught me was, was Ivica uh, from Croatia. He taught me that through sending me code, sending me a patch of how to make it so that you could deploy modules, uh, uh, war files back then, uh, inside LifeRay and customize LifeRay. So he taught me that. Um, I didn't know what, um, uh, what Spring was or inversion of control, blah, blah, blah. I didn't understand any of that. It was all community members teaching me. I didn't know what MVC was. Um, so I just ended up saying, the only skill I, I uh, had back then, which I would tell myself never to lose, is just keep trying, keep pushing hard, keep writing code, and keep listening to other people. I, I never imagined that uh, Liferay would be here today, um, where we are. I never imagined that I would have friends around the world and when I think about why I did this, for the love of my church, um, it reminds me ultimately that life exists for the love of people. And so when we work now as a company of seven, 800 people um, and um, clients around the world and a community where we get to hang out at, in Amsterdam and have lots of fun, um, that, that brings me back and, and keeps my frame of mind so that my purpose is always there, so that I don't get burnt out from the startup world, and I don't get cocky from uh, worshiping the work of my own hands. Now that I've shared what's on my heart, um, I want to give it back to Jorge to give you guys uh, the details of what's coming up for this year. So it's been a pretty amazing journey, and we've learned a lot of things. So if I had to summarize in four words what we've learned, it would be these four words. Be proud and stay humble. There are a lot of things to be proud about. We feel proud about a product that inspires. Brian mentioned how he's been able to meet people from all around the world, and we are very, very happy. And personally, very excited that library is used all around the world to do very, very innovative, very, very diverse project. So just to highlight three of them, Splash is a website to promote education. And when you connect education with open source, amazing things happen. We're also being very proud to be successful in the enterprise world. And companies like HP is using us for some of their B2B portals, in this case, for their partners. And then we have companies, even in 
Africa, for example, who are they doing amazing stuff. And this is Britam, who uses LifeRay for a financial advisory portal, for a customer service portal, for a partner service portal, for several corporate websites, and why not? Their corporate intranet. It's pretty amazing, right? So we are really proud of the product that we've been able to build during the years. We're also really proud of the team that has made all of this possible. We have an amazing team. You may have met many of them. You're going to meet even more today and tomorrow. So, yeah, it's, it's really exciting to have such a great team. And of course, we're really, really proud of our community. And we're really, really happy whenever we get to these events and we're able to hang out with you guys. Then being proud must be together with being humble. Otherwise, you get cocky, right? which we really want to avoid. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this picture. This is a modern version of a very famous picture, which was taken in year 1990, which is the pale blue dot. A pale blue dot that you can see there, again, this is a modern picture from 2013. That is small dot right there is where everybody who lives today, everybody who has ever lived, has been. So it's a good reminder of how insignificant we are. Right? If, we, if you look at it from the greater scheme of things, in this case of the universe. I think it's a good reminder. Right? I like it as a reminder that we don't need to think of ourselves as something very important, but we need to stay humble together with being proud of what we've done. So what does that mean? What does that translate to? I think Brian expressed it very well, but I wanted to highlight again. First, you need to continue working hard. It doesn't matter what you've achieved. You need to continue working hard. And for us, one thing that has been very, very important is to listen. When you listen, especially when you listen very smart guys like you are, then that's when you learn. And that's a very big lesson for us as well. So anyway, you are not here only to hear about our history. You're here also to know about what our vision for Life Ray is. So I'm going to go ahead to it, and I'm not going to do it alone. I've said we have a great team, so I'm going to be inviting to the States some of our great team members. So when I think about the vision of the product, I like to remember this quote. It's from Cassie Sierra, and she says, don't make an awesome product make your users awesome. And for us, users are not only end users, but also developers. Our goal is not to make the best product possible. Our goal is to make each of you and each of your users awesome. That's our ultimate goal. So how do we achieve that? What's our vision for achieving that? I'm going to share four keys. Four keys of our vision for making each of you, each of our users awesome. Number one. You're probably familiar with it already. A solid modular foundation. In the last few years, we've been investing a lot in modularity. We've been talking about it in our last events. If you've been visiting our events, if you've been following us, you know we've been very big about this. Probably the person who is to thank the most for this part of the vision is Ray Oye, who is around here with us, who started saying how important modularity is to be able to keep this success, to be able to maintain this big product that we're building for the long term. And he really made us see how important this is and how we had to invest on it. Modularity is really important, and I think the whole industry recognizes it. From the back-end world to the front-end world, everybody I think it's undeniable that it's becoming more and more important. Yes, last week or the week before, Java 9 was announced, and they're also making a huge investment on modularity in the JVM itself. So it's most, more important than ever. At the same time, like every big technical idea, there is always sometimes hype. And there are many perspectives of modularity, just like there are many perspectives of any technology. And it's very important to understand the core concept and not just let yourself go with the trends. Because if you let go with the trends, then you'll be going up in this trend, down this other trend, then up again. And one person who has lived this in first person, who has seen how that may happen, but has also seen all the great things of modularity in particular, and I want to welcome him to the States, is Milen Diankov. Mm. 
No, no toques. Cógelo. Take it. All right. Thank you. Well, you said it all, so I don't know what I'm supposed to say now. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm going to go by a story. And that story, it's over a decade long. And it, it goes back to the days where I was working with another company. And I was responsible mostly for e-commerce solutions for telecommunication companies, which was a service integrator, so custom-made stuff. And a customer came to us, and they had this e-commerce platform selling books online, which was basically what they had is a web form. So you put your order online, and then they store this in a database or a file system or whatever. And what they had later on was a bunch of independently deployable jar files, which were run by Linux cron jobs. And they would just start once in a while and then process the orders, do shipping, payments, all kinds of things. So the customer came to us and says, well, this is becoming unmanageable. I can't deal with that stuff anymore. And um, uh, we, we, need, we need something that can evolve, that has you know, like, uh, recommendations and all, all these like, nice features that the modern e-commerce needs. Don't worry about it, we're the experts. We have this perfect e-commerce system that's going to solve all your problems. They pay the bill, we install the software, off the shelf, tiny little customizations, customer is happy. We were very proud of ourselves. And we, of course, made laugh of them, like, how do you develop software like this, like Java, cron jobs, like, pfft. Right, I met this customer a couple of years ago, and it's some event, and I told, asked them how that goes. Uh, how, how, how's the system, how's the business? And they said, well, uh, we gave up on that, and uh, we are now transitioning everything to microservices. Okay, guys, you were doing microservices before the microservices term existed, and you're now going back to that? Oh, well, yeah, but, you know, because you know, that's like the big monolith and, uh, and we, can't, uh, we, know, we can't extend it and every time we want to add a feature, it's, uh, it's really troublesome and so forth. What happened in the meantime is they, they lost half of their stuff when they moved from like, their old microservices to the platform and then now hiring people again to be able to build it from scratch. So I see that happens quite a lot. I see a lot of people going with, uh, what we need is a flexibility. We need to be as flexible as possible. So none of this stuff out there is for us. We're going to have to build it from the bottom up or ourselves. And then it turns out that, well, it takes too long or it's, uh, it, it's too hard to build stuff. And then someone jumps in and says, well, forget about all that stuff. Let's buy that you know, off-the-shelf commercial product that has it all. Right? And then I go for that, and then it turns out, well, we need to customize that product. We need to actually make it do the job the way we need it to be done, and it's hard. So then someone else jumps in and says, well, forget about that. You know, it costs too much money, and it's too complicated, and it's too you know, closed, so let's build it all from scratch. Right? And, and we, we just go back and forth. And if you think, and now the question is, why is that? That is because we either focus on a business side or developer side. And um, Daniel Neyman, in, in his book, um, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, defined the term wasabi. It's what you see is all there is. And this is to describe our perception, our over-self-confidence to the point of reach, reaching arrogance that we believe that what we know is the only thing out there. And it's the perfect solution. And so when you get developers, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna want to talk about, you know, the details of the system where businesses focus on what else. What we need and where Alifre is aiming to is to 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 combine the two. And how we do that is with solid foundation. So you need to lay down the foundation for a platform that allows you to do both. And this is essentially what we've been doing for the last couple of years. And now that we have that, the future is a solid foundation on top of which you can deploy an independent services that can actually do the things that you guys need to do. So for developers, those can be tiny little services that interact be between each other, totally non-visible. And for business users, those will be comp compositions of more complex, business-oriented, uh, value de delivering business value features that you can deploy at a time. So we aim to give you both. 
at the same time. The customizability, the flexibility, the ability to develop in whatever you need to do. And at the same time, pick and choose and assemble the system ready to go on production from a pre-ready, business valuable tested components. And obviously, as you know, we're not there yet, but that is what LifeRay will be in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Milen. Thank you, Milen. Well, one of the things that really motivate me is to see these teammates like Milen that are so passionate about the things that, that they are doing. So we've talked about this solid foundation. What else? Well, a solid foundation is nothing if it cannot be used. One of the things that I liked the most when I started using LiveRay many years ago is that it had this service API that could, could be invoked remotely and could also be invoked locally. And that's been an enabler for many of the great solutions that have been built on top. But the world has changed, and what was enough several years ago is not enough yet. So one of the things that we want to invest on is on a much better set of APIs that are designed to evolve and that allow for more and more headless usage of LiveRay Portal. And there is one person within LiveRay who has been saying over the years since he joined how important APIs are. And they really become much more important. But I'm not, not going to explain it myself, obviously. I'm going to invite to the stage Jose Navarro. So a couple of months ago, my girl, my daughter, she's 11 years old, was at home and found this book. And she said, Daddy, what is this thing of the World Wide Web? And what is Mosaic? So I started to explain to her what is a protocol, what is a client, what is a browser. And finally, she said, Daddy, you know what? I didn't need a book to learn how to use Chrome. And you did. I thought you were smarter. So, well, you know, kids never lie. So for those of you who are under the 40s, I want to introduce you this guy. This is Mosaic. And it's an important thing for all of you, since you are web developers, right? So starting from this, uh, if you wanted to be in the internet, if you want to provide on, an online service, you want to need this. And this was the one and only way to be in the internet. And HTML and related technologies were the lingua franca for you. So you need this. A few years ago, or a few years later than Mosaic, new browsers appeared. And you need to work a bit hard to make sure that your web pages work with those new browsers. But it wasn't a big deal. It was a browser. It should work. Okay? So everything will be fine. But around 10 years ago, mobile devices appeared. Our users started to use mobile devices. Luckily for us, those devices had a quite decent browser. So again, we need to tweak a little bit. We invented a fancy thing called responsive design. We started to play with CSS, media queries. And finally, our web pages can be adapted to different screen sizes. It was great for us. But what happened in these years? New devices appear. Some of them don't have a browser like your smartwatches. And some of them don't have even a screen. Think about chatbots, drones, this little, that little thing, the home speaker. How can we code for a device that it doesn't have even a screen? So we need to change our mindset. We need to go from a browser-centric approach to an API-centric approach. And what does it mean? It means that your servers, your systems, instead of providing a UI in the form of a web page, they need to provide data. They need to provide raw data to the devices, to the browsers, to the systems, to the front ends. And those front ends are responsible for building the UI. I like to think about headless software like this. Your system provides energy to the front ends, your system just gives them data. 
and the front ends, the clients, the electric devices take that energy to build something useful, to build an actual UI. And the client is responsible to decide how to use that energy, how to use that data. And if you go for this path, and if you start thinking in these terms, you probably will end up with this approach, with this. As your API evolves, you probably, if you don't work hard, you probably will break the API. And since the API is broken, the client won't work anymore. And the client won't be happy anymore. So you need to think about how to design your APIs to evolve. That's quite important nowadays. So web APIs are more important than ever. Think that more devices will appear in these years. Some of them won't have a web browser. Some of them won't have a screen. So you need web APIs for sure. And choose the right tools for this job. It's quite difficult to do it well if you don't choose the right tool. Craft them with care and make sure that you can use, build your APIs as good as you build your browser systems nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. OK, so we have a modular foundation. We have APIs. And it's very important to highlight what Jose said. Those APIs must be designed to evolve. But why do, you, why do we create these APIs? We create these APIs to create all different types of front ends for all different types of applications or devices. And this is the third key to our vision. How do we want to empower any developer in the world to develop these new applications for any device. This is one part of our vision that may not have been as clear in the past, and we wanted to make it very clear. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to reinvent front-end technologies out there. Our vision can be enhanced in these two words. We want to embrace and enhance. We want to embrace the existing technologies, the modern technologies that sometimes evolve very, very fast and we want to enhance them. What do we mean by that? We want to build specific tools that add on top of what the best state-of-the-art tools of the moment provide. We don't want to reinvent the web. We don't want to reinvent the awesome tools that are out there, like the most popular of the, of the time, like right now maybe React or Angular or now it's Vue. Those are awesome tools. We want to build on top. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, or we want to complement them. The same thing for the technologies to develop native clients like Android or iOS or a specific API for a bot engine. We want to embrace and enhance these modern front-end technologies. Now, the word modern is a little bit dangerous, right? What does modern really mean? Sometimes the, the world seems like it's, it's moving so fast, right? You've probably heard this joke from the front-end developer coming from one week vacation, and he gets back to his workmate and says, hey, can I still talk about React? without looking like the guy from last week, right? It's moving so fast. So one thing that is very important as the world moves so fast is to understand what is the goal of moving so fast and not only focus on the shiny new thing, but be able to acknowledge what's, what are the good things in it just as what are the good things in past technologies as well. And the perfect person to tell you all about it is Sema Balsas. <laughs> Don't leave. Uh, this is such a big crowd, man. They are very nice. I don't, I don't think, no, I don't think I can do this. Sorry. Yeah. So, guys, yeah, I, I think he needs a little bit of love. Of love. So he's going to make an important confession. So can you guys give him, give him a bigger applause, please? <laughs> you can do it, Sema. Cool. Thanks. OK. So. There it goes. So, hi, everyone. I'm Chema. And oh, sorry, I went back. I'm so nervous. I'm a Flash developer. 
Wow, so someone else out there like me? Okay, we can get together later and maybe form a support group or something. Feels so good to let it out, finally. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm a Flash developer. I started as a Flash developer and I'm actually proud of that old time when so many of us young people were getting started, getting to know this new web world that was in front of us and to explore all these new opportunities that we had. And for a while, and at the peak of its, uh, of its importance, Flash had a huge community, uh, one of the biggest ever seen back then, uh, connecting millions of developers, some of the smartest, brightest minds in the world, all working together, sharing knowledge, uh, reaching pretty much every uh, user out there, every device out there, and uh, across every device and everywhere in the world. So we had this huge potential to build and deliver the best user experiences ever seen by the world, to develop the best software ever seen. And after a while, I think we really, we really did it. And this is proof of it. That's what Flash developer, Flash develop was all about. Uh, just kidding. That's what you might think. But uh, what actually Flash brought to us and to the world was a framework, was a tool, was a platform which we could use to shape the world, to shape the world as we saw it, to build the experiences we had and we could imagine. And it all started just as an animation, a silly animation platform, uh, but it quickly evolved into creating rich web applications, rich web, uh, sorry, interactive websites uh, that push the boundaries of the known web at that moment. And it changed how animation was understood in the web, how uh, designers and how artists could express themselves. It even brought audio to the web, something that was unheard of, and it changed how we consume that. Gaming. Gaming changed forever. Uh, the way developers used to develop and deploy and deliver their games just uh, changed from, the, from one day to the other. And applications started to grow, started to get more complex, started to get ubiquitous, and everyone could use something anywhere. Uh, so you didn't have to install something, go on a client on site to deliver your app. Everyone could use it anywhere just by accessing a browser. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, we even had virtual reality. This is something we're still reaching for today. And we had it in Flash back then. And what to say about video? So Flash actually changed the world. It, uh, it opened new doors and new paths for us to express ourselves. After all, you all know how history went and where Flash is today. Uh, but I think for the better of the world, the good things about Flash still live in every front-end developer out there. <laughs> so this urge, this uh, look for the innovation, for change, for constant improvement. And as Jorge was saying, sometimes it may feel too pressured, too fast, too willing to change just for the sake of change. But in the end, it's not just about the change. It's not just about the tooling or the new frameworks. It's not even about the platform. It's about finding the right tools to build the right solution for your problem. And that's all it is about. And that's the way we have to see how front-end is evolving today. And in that sense, Library's vision is to, is, is to embrace and enhance this platform. To embrace it means that allow you and give you the power to just use any tool out there, any tool of your choice to express yourself. So the, if you're feeling more comfortable with some of the frameworks out there, some of the tooling, you should be able to just use it to build your, your solutions. And on top of that, we want to enhance it. We want to provide you with the right tools and building blocks uh, so that you can build the world that you want. In essence, we want you to have the right tools and the right building blocks to shape the world any way you can imagine. Thank you. So you did a good job, Chema. So great modular platform, evolvable API, 
awesome front ends. Those are three keys. What is the fourth key? For us, the fourth key is the developer experience. You need to have a great developer experience to be able to build all of this. And if you've been following us, you probably know that we've been improving a lot on the developer experience to develop on Library Portal and on Library DXP. We've been introducing command line tools and IDEs. We've been improving the way we document. We've been improving the way we allow extending and building on top of the platform. In addition to all of that, a few years ago, two people within Library started to think, what would be the best possible developer experience be about? Not even related to Library, but in general. What are the systems that can be built today? How, how should they be built? What is, what is the best tooling that a developer should have in their hands? So they started a project that today we know as we deploy. So I want to welcome one of the two people that started that conversation to the stage to tell you all about it. Please welcome Seno Rocha. Hello, everybody. So, yeah, a few, few years ago, we, like, while we were building Life Portal and all these awesome open source projects that you already know, we, we noticed that maybe we could grab some pieces of that code and make it as external libraries. And uh, we noticed that, okay, like we have uh, UI components. Uh, we have like buttons and things like that. So maybe we can take those pieces out of this big software, make it as a standalone open source project so other people can consume even if they're not using our main solution. So we started to release more and more open source projects. So you probably heard about Alloy UI, Senna.js, Meta.js. So all these projects, they started with this feeling like, hey, we can help more people, we can reach more people. And we quickly realized, building each of those projects, that, okay, they're very nice, uh, and making open source is very cool, but open source is actually not about the source code at all. It was much more than that. Like, the whole developer experience when you, ex you just like see an open source project, like how you see the sections on the readme file, how you download, and what's the first experience when you just try to run a hello world. So there's so many pieces on an open source project that are so important. And we want to make sure that this is something that is very consistent and it's, and it's a good experience for you guys. So. Uh, we, we started to realize that, okay, those libraries are nice and they're helping a lot of people, but for each of those libraries, we're building different websites. And we were doing all this work. And for each of these websites, we needed to write more documentation, we needed a place to host those files and everything else. So we asked ourselves, okay, this whole process is kind of slow. Uh, we wanted to be more productive. That was our first thing. I was like, okay, how we as developers, as a company, as everything in the planet, like how we can be more productive. Uh, so we sat down to build something to be more productive. We didn't know the answer. We didn't know what was going to be the end thing, but we decided to do it. So we started with like a Node.js plugin and we, we noticed that, okay, this is nice, uh, this is helpful, but still, not there. Uh, There's so many pieces missing. So then with like all this uh, conversations about APIs and we noticed how important those things were, we're like, okay, let's build something uh, that you can create APIs on the cloud. And we, we actually announced it here as Launchpad. It was a prototype uh, and it was actually very good. We validated with you guys. And then it was very nice, but we noticed, okay, there's still like so many pieces missing. Like from the moment you build, from the moment that you deploy, there's so many pieces missing. So again, we sat down and then we built, we deploy. We showed the alpha last year. Uh, and now, uh, one year later, we have many announcements to make. We, we are super excited. We think this platform can drastically help you and your team to be more productive. That's our that's our goal. 
uh, and like for the, the next lot, we're going to talk more about it. And my goal is for all the things that we do at Liferay, not only we deploy, every single project that you work on, if you like love Liferay ID, if you love the portal CE, like everything, uh, we want you to have a good experience. We want you to feel like this, okay? So that's the goal, and I hope we can make that for you, okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Seno. So we deploy has been a great experience. It's, how, it's, it's a proof of how, yes, a good thought process can deliver a great product. But not only that, I think all this, this effort from the WeDeploy team has also allowed us to learn how to improve the developer experience for our other products. And one of the things that WeDeploy has gotten right from almost the very beginning is that the developer experience is not just when the developer is coding, but also the deployment. And one of the big innovations in deployment in the last few years is the cloud, whether it's a public cloud or the private cloud. And that's one of the areas where we've also been innovating, where we've been optimizing all of our products, is to make it possible or make it easier or make it faster, make it more productive to deploy on infrastructure as a service providers in platform as a service providers. So sometimes, yes, thinking out of the box not only helps you create new products, but improve your existing products as well. So, that's our vision, those four key points. But why? Why provide this platform that we believe is going to rock the future if nothing is built on top? Of course, that wouldn't make sense. The reason for this vision is to support, to empower you guys, to empower everybody, to empower ourselves to build great innovative solutions. And I'm going to use two examples of solutions that we're building within Liferay to illustrate this. The first one is a project we call modern site building. And it comes from a similar thought process as we deploy. It comes from thinking how, today, we're in 2017, what would be the best way for creating sites, for publishing and creating content? Let's reinvent it from scratch. Let's take the best of libraries, web content management capabilities, and let's take it to the next level. So we've started a very, very ambitious project. It has one of these big, hairy goals which is to be the best site creation and content management system ever. Is it right? Well, the good news is we believe we have the right platform to build it. This is one of our projects, and we'll tell you more during the event about it. But I'm even more excited about another project, another very innovative solution that we're building on top. It's related to commerce. If you know the history of library with commerce, you may know the shopping portlet. That's not one of the parts that we're proud of. This has nothing to do with it. Let's just make it clear from the very beginning. And the story of how all of this began, it's really, really amazing. So please, welcome to the States, Marco Leo, to tell you all about it. Hi, hi everybody. I don't know you, but I'm still shocked from Shema announcement. Really, Shema, you were really a Flash developer? You, you look much younger than you are. <laughs> wow. So, as today is the day of confession, I will make my confession. I will tell you how life rate commerce brings it to life thanks to a beer. I was a life rate, uh, I was an e commerce developer with a variety of technology out there, and I was seeing that this market was growing each day more. And forecasts say that the market in the next few years was just growing exponentially. But as the market grows, our project target change a lot. And our customer needs evolve too. We were seeing in the same time that B2B functionalities and B2B, uh, B2C functionality was converging. And this confirmed that commerce was changing a lot. So we saw that uh, all technology out there was missing some core capability for our need. Was missing things like enterprise content management, API first approach, or even uh, mobile strategy. But 
Then library seven came out. And with his modularity, was just the right choose, was just the right solution for take my vision to reality. And then, then it happened. I mean, I was a library community member, and last year I was a, dec a DevCon as you. And I was drinking a beer in a bar. Somebody can remember that I drink a lot of beer there. But then Brian Chan walked through me, and I said just, hi, Brian, how are you? You know, you have to know that as a library developer, I was reading Brian's name each day on each class of library code. So it was kind of satisfaction, you know, to meet the guy who started the library. And then I don't know why, and even I think that Brian does too as well, but he stopped it. He stopped it, and we started to speak about my experience with library and about our vision of the product. And then a year later, I am here speaking to you, saying that I am a member of Lifery and I'm leading a team that is going to ship Lifery commerce to you all. Thank you, guys. So it's a really amazing story and one of the big announcements that we're going to be making during DEF CON. So let's recap. Our vision of the Lifery platform starts with this modular foundation. It's a modular foundation on top of which we build APIs. We already have a lot of APIs, but we want to focus especially for the future on evolvable APIs, APIs that are designed to evolve, that don't create that sensation of the plug that you cannot plug anymore because the API has changed. That's very, very important for us. And the reason for providing this API is to support building all sorts of applications for all sorts of devices. And of course, with a very, very important focus on the developer experience. And why are we doing this? We're doing this to be able to create very innovative solutions, whether it's the web experience improvements that I've been talking about, whether it's commerce, or whether it's your solution. So my question for you guys is, what are you guys going to build? Thank you. <laughs>